Hey y'all, welcome back to my channel. This is Bernetta Rochelle and in today's video I am going to talk about, you know, a little bit about who I am and how I got here to being the lead contributor, the creator, and the founder of Soul Simulator Sanctuary. Um, so I guess you could say this is a story time video and I hope that you know my journey resonates with some of you so that you can start to reflect on your own journey and see some things that could possibly benefit other people if you share with them so let's see i started this journey as a child literally i i've known since intermediate school that my purpose was to help people I didn't exactly understand or know the capacity and when I told people that they didn't get it because they thought nonprofit work and people don't get paid for that so yeah I, I didn't have a full grasp of what that meant I just knew it at 11 that that was what I was supposed to do here I am 36 I'm trying to remember how old I am and it's all coming together but from that time to now I am able to see what is that 25 years is that 25 years I taught English as a second language I did not teach math okay I can teach you to read to write uh, to string words together but math is not my strong point and that's why I got invented CPAs and accountants so anyway, I, 25 years of helping people in different capacities, different ways, I've always wanted to be a background person just to do what needed to be done so that the organization, the club, the group, whatever can move. But that never worked out. I was always thrust into the forefront, thrust into being the person who spoke on behalf of the group. Even group projects in school, I somehow would take the lead and become the leader and people will listen so I've stopped fighting it I am a leader I'm just not a boisterous leader but I am a leader nonetheless so that is something that I've just accepted um, as part of what I've been called to do and I know how to do it I mean I have a whole master's <laughs> in organizational leadership so I do understand how to run an organization but anyway, so starting at 11, I just always volunteered to help, always wanted to do things to make sure that other people were okay, that other people got what they needed, that, I, you know, if I could prevent pain from happening to someone else, I would, I would give what I had to other people. Um, I would feel so distraught if I could not help people, that I would take on their problems and it would just eat away at me, eat away at me. And so um, that was problem. I needed to learn how to separate helping people from um, helping them becoming a hindrance to me. I needed, I hadn't learned that. So over the years, I've gotten better with that. I can help people, I can pray for people, I can send you some resources, but I'm not about to become engulfed in your situation. Like, excuse me, like I was before. So that is probably why it's taken me so long to be here. Um, and then also timing what was happening in the world. So anyway, um, but I'm an introvert. You can tell by shirt, introvert. I don't like big crowds of people. I don't like going out. Like right now, it's, I have been thriving at home because I have not been bothered by anybody or what's been going on. I understand a lot of people have not been doing as well. That is one of the reasons I'm incorporating mental health support groups into the sanctuary to provide an outlet for you to learn how to process uh, mentally and emotionally, be equipped with skills that you can add to your toolbox so that when situations come, you won't let them overtake your mind or overwhelm your emotional uh, state. So. That's a little caveat for people who 
are thinking about joining Soul Stimulated Sanctuary, we will eventually have mental health support groups uh, by the summer. So anyway, I have learned that and things work for me in groups of three. I did a whole, whole blog post on that. And so usually every three years, something major shifts in my life. Something major changes and is what I've done for other people that I've noticed that changes every three years. Now with the Soul Simulated Sanctuary, we don't know what God has, but we know what he has for me to do for you right now. And that's what I'm going to do for you right now. I'm not worried about what's going to happen in three years. I'm focused on what's happening right now. But the three years of being able to do different things over time, leading groups, helping people, all of that experience, all of that knowledge is the foundation of what I'm using to create and carry Soul Simulator Sanctuary. And I'm not one of those people to run around and tell you, do you know who I am? Do you know what I've done? Um, I don't care. Um, if you didn't take the time to know who I am, then maybe you and I don't need to know or do anything together. I don't owe you an explanation to my experience and I don't owe you an explanation to why I am gifted to do what it is that I've been called to do. I don't owe, I don't owe anyone an explanation for that and I'm not going to get one. All of my stuff is out there. You can look at that yourself so using my spiritual gifts which i have still not publicly shared uh with anyone but you may be able to figure it out um over time and if you're in the sanctuary if you're doing the spiritual gift assessment which you will receive um when you join you'll be able to know what the gifts are um i believe there is 16 16 18 around there get spiritual gifts and so I have three that were really 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 high and one of them was really really shocking but it was it was number three it wasn't my top two my top two very familiar with what those were because I have been operating in them literally since I was 11 literally since I was 11 probably one of them since I was maybe five or six. First story my mom told me is that um, some man walked by or whatever. It was either a family gathering or an event or something like that. I don't think he was family, but she said I immediately ran and jumped in her lap. And I'm not a clingy person. Um, so she said she knew something was off. And so at that time, um, come to find out something was wrong with that man. So I've known things for a while about other, just feeling other people. So anyway, you, saying all that to say <laughs> is 25 years of, from the time I knew that God said I was supposed to help people till now, during that time, I have been prepared by God. I have been put in very, very difficult situations. I mean, situations that made me cry and not just cry, sometimes wail because I was so hurt by what um, happened. The intensity in which I operate overwhelms me for a time and I get that. I am an intense person. I'm not passionate uh, what people will call passionate in that sense. I'm intense, right? If there's something I'm working on, I'm going to make sure that it is done to the best of my ability without fault and done in excellence and the outcome is a desired outcome for everyone involved. So if that means I have to push, I'm going to push. Um, but now I understand how to push lovingly, but uh, before I was not... It was like, you get the task done or else. Um, so, you know, yeah, during that 25 years, I've had to learn how to be a little bit more loving and show a little bit more grace to other people because they are not as intense as I am. So over these past 25 years, I have 
as an introvert who went to a predominantly white school who lived in a predominantly rural white community was on student council was on Spanish club board I mean and I can't speak Spanish to save my life Jesus Christ how did that happen <laughs> anyway um from middle school high school captain captain of sports team college you know my first semester of college outside of high school because I started college at 16. I was still in high school when I started college um, and it, let me tell you this story so my very first college class I was had like literally just turned 16 and or no I was 16 and I didn't have a car so my mom had to take me to school Nothing big. I met Tyler Junior College. You know, it's a community college in Smith County, Texas. And I go in there and it's a government class. And I'm, you know, nothing of it. I'm sitting in the back. Hopefully no one sees me. It's like probably 30 people. It's summer, so it's right after my junior year of high school. I am younger than the majority of my class. So I'm 16, you know, 16 about to enter senior year of high school and he's like first day okay everyone let's get to know each other let's say who we are you know how old we are blah blah, blah. and I'm like oh my god I have to talk in front of all these people so I'm sitting in the back everyone's sharing you know it's community college some of these people are, are mothers and fathers or you know they've been out of school a while so they're in their 20s some in their 30s some in their late 30s there were a couple well, there were a few people from my high school, but you know, they're like 17, 18. I'm 16. Again, I'm 16. So they get to me and I'm like, my name is Bernetta Freeney. I am going into my senior year at White House High School and I'm 16. The whole class went, oh! <laughs> I was so mortified by that. They were like, are you serious? And I just melted in my chair. And the professor, you know, he let everyone continue. And I was just so embarrassed. And then, like, this mom came up to me. And she was like, I wish my kids would, you know, be this uh, adamant about their uh, schooling. She didn't use the word adamant. But you understand, you know, she, she tried to encourage me. And here come my classmates from high school. You're still 16? Y'all, I was so embarrassed. I'm like, yeah, I'm still 16, you know. Y'all didn't have to make a big deal out of it. We all got, we've all known each other since elementary. How dare y'all embarrass me like this? And then we're walking out the door, class is over. My mom is sitting outside of the classroom. She sat outside of the classroom the entire time I was in there. I did not know. So she was like, how was your first day? <laughs> how was your first day of school? So if I wasn't already mortified enough, having to share who I was in front of everyone and my age. My mom was sitting outside my classroom and asked how my first day of college was. So that is a random story I wanted to share. But um, needless to say, I have been in situations where I look like I don't belong there, that I'm not qualified and I'm very much qualified and I very much belong there. And so that experience at 16 just kind of, it really shaped me because I'm like, okay, you know what? If I could be the youngest person in this college class and I killed it, I made a, like an A plus in that class, but it was government and, and I enjoyed that subject. I knew any situation I was in didn't matter. I can always rise to the occasion. So that was probably one of those early tests that I knew then, like, I can do this. I can do anything, I, you know. Nothing's gonna make or break me. So, now moving on to um, actual college when I graduate from high school, 17 now, I joined them from high school. I've already, you know, finished my first semester of college per se, because I had taken four classes by then. I had taken, yeah. Yeah, I had taken four college classes by the time I graduated high school. And so my very first semester of college, 
I was at Tarrant County Community or Tarrant County College, so I did not apply to college at all. Um, my mom drove me to that community college and enrolled me into college because I didn't have plans to go to college. I didn't know what I wanted to do, so since I didn't know, I just didn't do anything. So my very first semester at Tarrant County College, this is in Arlington, Texas, I become vice president of the Black Student Union. 18, no, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I had just turned 18 years old and I am vice president of the Black Student Union and a lot of the people in there were like mid to like 20s, you know, they had like full-time jobs and they were going to community college to try to get their work on getting credits for their degree. At 18, I am leading the one of the largest organizations on campus. I don't even know how people voted for me. Like, I didn't know any of those people. Like, a lot of them grew up in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, so they knew each other or knew of each other because of uh, their schools may have played against each other. Here I am coming from small town America, East Texas, and I become vice president of the Black Student Union at 18. So that in and of itself, having that leadership role, and then the president and I, we really transformed that organization. We were able to go to the conferences. Uh, I remember we came all the way down to University of Houston Clear Lake for one conference, but membership grew. We really got it organized. We had to find uh, a, a professor to be the the sponsor for it. I mean, there was a lot of work that went into it and I loved it. That's when I realized I loved doing the behind the scenes work. I loved um, the paperwork and putting things together and the strategy and planning out from start to finish. I loved it. You know, he could go up there, say his speeches, do whatever. He worked full time job. You know, I'm 18, I don't work full time job. I didn't want to be in college anyway, so I'm there full time. And he led the organization and I did all the other stuff. I loved it. So that was another moment that I know that God was preparing me uh, for what I'm doing now, being able to really manage things behind, manage things behind the scenes. Ministry, when I was in college, we had no budget. In fact, the ministry was on life support. Um, I was told as long as I didn't spend money and what I came up with wasn't too out of the box, we could possibly do it. Well, the first lady let me work. She let me get creative and use my imagination. I mean, we even had like the army fatigue shirts with the block lettering in yellow. This is way before people were doing it now. Um, <laughs> and then she eventually gave me a budget and this is where fellowship truly transformed the young adult ministry at that church through intentional activity, Sunday school classes, we had retreats, we went out to eat at least twice a month together. And we had, um, we went bowling, we, we did a lot of things. This helped create a bond for people who were away from home. The young adult ministry were college age and like young married couples. So a lot of them were either here at school away from their family or they moved here as a young married couple um, to a new city for a job. So they didn't really know a lot of people. We had to create that feeling in that ministry so that when they came, they felt that they belonged. They felt welcome. They immediately knew that people were going to be there for them because of that feeling that we created through the fellowship we increased sunday school and bible study attendance uh, people didn't just come for the fun stuff they also began to come to sunday school and we ended up with two classes one in the first uh, block and the second block it was a it was a pretty big church so there were two sunday school hours even though I left that church, the feeling of belonging has not been felt with any other Christian community I have had uh, or I've been a part of since. I make myself comfortable because I'm comfortable with myself, but having a sense of belonging 
when you're part of a Christian community is something that you shouldn't force yourself to feel. It should just happen. And if it doesn't happen, then you're probably not in the right space for you or they haven't created the atmosphere for fellowship to take place. So you have to evaluate, do you feel that you truly belong there or are you just telling yourself that you're comfortable in this space? Um, because you can make yourself comfortable, but after a while friction will rear its head and you'll start to see that that may not be the place for you or you were placed there and you are the one who is supposed to create that fellowship feeling with the other believers at the church. So, you know, if that's the case, pray about that. Um, then I get to Texas Westland. Um, that was a fluke. I was literally walking the halls at Tarrant County College and the four year universities and colleges were there because it was transfer. Uh, what is it called? Transfer care. So there are just different schools. And again, I'm not interested in going to school. So I'm just walking down trying to get to, <laughs> to go buy some food. And uh, so I'm trying to go buy some food. And I see this one lady, she's standing at her table all by herself. No one's over there. And she had like some candy or something. So I was like, I'm going to just stop and get some candy on my way to the cafeteria to go get some food. And so while I'm there, I'm like, well, what college is this? And she's like, Texas Wesleyan. I had never heard of it. So I'm like, okay, you know, what do you do? Because I'm trying to be polite while I'm trying to take some candy. And she's so excited because no one was at her table. So I don't know if she, no one had been at her table. And she was telling me all about it. And she was like, you know, we have this transfer scholarship. And I was like, cool. Because even though I never applied to college, I applied to, I don't know how many scholarships and I won every last one of them because they, they writing and I'm a blogger. Now I'm a blogger. So, you know, I won every scholarship, even though I never applied to college. So it was, yeah, I think that's probably where my parents were like, how do you win every scholarship, but you don't even apply to college? Where do you think that money's going to go? I don't know. They just asked me to write a paper. Okay. So I wrote it and I won the money. So she's telling me about this transfer scholarship and I didn't even have to do anything. I said, okay. So I filled out the application and they gave me the scholarship <laughs> because I filled out the paper. So that's how I ended up at Texas Westland. There was no rhyme or reason. So now I'm at this Methodist college. Uh, Texas Westland used to prepare Methodist ministers or, or people to work in the Methodist churches or ministries. And I'm Baptist. So I'm like, okay, so I'm at Texas Westland and there is where I really, really, really learned. Um, my English teachers were actual lawyers, so they were very strict when it came to writing. So that's where I really fine tuned my writing. They didn't take crap at Westland. So you really had to rise to the occasion. My philosophy teacher and I always got into it because he always wanted to, for some reason, argue with me. And I'm a person who I, at that time, I really liked to argue back. So I don't know if he thought it was fun, but it irritated me, but I was not going to let him win. I knew that much. I always got an A um, <laughs> his papers. So maybe he liked the banter because other people really didn't talk. And me being an introvert, very talkative in the philosophy class that said a lot and then I really enjoyed my religious classes because they were <laughs> led by Methodist retired Methodist ministers so it was quite interesting you know them being Methodist and I'm being a, a, a Baptist and just our thoughts and interpretations of the Bible so anyway Westland was really Texas Westland uh, in Fort Worth was a really 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 good training ground as far as preparing me to rise to occasion to be able to really understand how to not accept mediocrity to not accept status quo to always strive for excellence so that's what i took away from my two years um my junior and senior year at texas wesleyan and then while i was there i won the scholarship with the ywca of fort worth and tarrant county again write a paper 
I'm telling you, I mean, I, that should have probably been my calling. I don't know, Lord. Teach people how to write papers for scholarships because I want every scholarship I apply to, every single one. And so um, part of that, my senior year, was to sit on the board of directors for the YWCA of Fort Worth and Tarrant County. And, you know, of course they gave me money to go to school and I had to show up to all the board meetings, which was so much fun. Um, it's, you're in a room with like 50, 60 women, the most powerful women in Tarrant County, Texas. These people were like CEOs, vice presidents, executive directors. I really got um, along with the vice president of marketing for Pure One Imports. Like she and I just clicked. And so she always made sure she checked up on me and gave me good advice, you know, my senior year. And the new CFO for the YWCA at the time actually went to high school with my mom. So when she and I were talking and I said something, and then that's when she and I found out, like, oh, okay, you know my mom. Small world, because my mom grew up in uh, Fort Worth. She graduated from high school in Fort Worth. So anyway, being there my senior year of college, surrounded by the most powerful women in that county, and they treated me like I was an equal. That gave me the confidence that I don't care what room I go in, like, I belong to be, I deserve to be in this room room I belong here because uh, those women did not treat me any different they did not treat me like a college student they did not treat me like I didn't know anything they expected me to chime in um, at the meetings they expected me to give input when there were new programs that needed to be created or we needed to decide how money was going to be spent for the YWCA how the money was going to be spent for the three daycare centers that they ran how we were going to spend money for the foster girls for the girls who were in foster care that they took care of like I was expected to contribute and here I am a 20 year old given input to a multi-billion dollar a multi-million dollar organization and I was I was expected to contribute that was part of my scholarship and so being there that gave me the confidence like I, I, I can do anything I can be anywhere like no one is above me in a sense and I'm saying that like I don't have this feeling of anyone is ever superior to me not after being in that room, not after being surrounded by those women who did not take crap from anyone. And they told me and they taught me how not to take crap from anyone, but to still stand firm in who you are and know that whatever you know is what you need to know to be there. And so I I would never forget that experience. So, um, yeah, so anyway, <laughs> so now that I've graduated from um, Texas Wesleyan, I go to Florida for a while, stay with my aunt. Then I find my sister, she like, okay, I dare you to move to Atlanta. You know, we were joking around. I'm like, I'm going to do it. I'm going to move. So I moved to Atlanta. I got a job uh, working for a nonprofit that was started by a retired basketball player. He retired from the Sacramento King, Sacramento Kings, but he grew up in Atlanta. So he his sister ran the organization. Um, oh, I did not. The reason I'm share, not sharing the name is because I did not like working there. I did not get along with the person I was directly working with. Like she and I butted heads all the time. But I was very good at what I did. What they hired me for. And um, it was working with middle school kids and, you know, leading group sessions with them and doing activities and all kinds of stuff. Like, cause in undergrad, I worked at places like Campfire USA and um, communities and schools where I was the after school supervisor. So I was familiar with kids. I had been babysitting since I was 11. So I'm good with kids, very good with kids. But I'm not, I was not so good with that coworker who thought she was my supervisor and she was not. So anyway, uh, I'm only there for a little while and then still in Atlanta I go back to a job that I had originally accepted but left to take the job at that nonprofit. So I called the lady 
And I'm like, look, that job didn't work out. If you have anything, you know, I'll take it. And she was like, I'm so glad you're coming back. I, you know, it was a tutoring company. And this was right when Bush had just implemented a whole bunch of money for after school programs, for tutoring programs, for all kinds of things for students. So a lot of small black owned businesses were popping up and she was one of them. And so I went back to work with her and I loved it. It just wasn't enough hours and it didn't pay enough, but I loved what I did. And she was great. She always tried to make sure that she gave me um, as many hours as possible. Uh, then now the pay per hour was really good at that time. It was like $17 an hour. Now this is in 2006, 2007. And right now they're trying to get minimum wage for $15 an hour. So anyway, um, so here I am, 21, whatever, making $17 an hour there after I leave in a nonprofit where I was, was going to make $32,000 a year. I thought that was great money. <laughs> it was to, you know, a 21 year old kid. So I decide like, you know, this ain't for me. And it wasn't the job. It was Atlanta. I just, I'm sorry, people from Atlanta. I didn't like living there. I felt like everybody I ran into was trying out to be on Real Housewives of Atlanta and that bothered me. So I moved back to Texas, I moved to Houston. And that's where I started. Um, I got a job teaching in Houston Independent School District. I taught there for four years, didn't leave on good terms. Um, and then they're gonna send me a certified letter asking me to return. That's a whole nother uh, video. So anyway, in the four years that I was there, I did so much to bring enjoyment to students, not just in my classroom, but the whole school. Like I led the Black History Month, not just the program. We did daily activities, weekly activities. We had a Black History program. Like it was a big, thing. it was so big that we broke fire code every year for the program. The fire part would literally come and say, seriously, you got to send some parents home. What am I supposed to do? We can't have more than one performance. Um, and these people want to see their kids perform and these people want to see their neighbors. And so anyway, it was, we would have to spill people over into like the library and, or the multimedia center, you know, that's what they call them now. And the cafeteria manager, she would open the kitchen and people would be standing there. Like it was just, it was so overwhelming. The support for this that I did every year at the school and but it was so taxing, emotionally taxing for me because I had to write the whole play. I wrote every song that they sung. I, you know, coordinated that their their costumes. Other teachers would ask me, how did I want the set? And they would sit there and spend hours creating the set. Like it was a production. And here I am again, one of the youngest teachers on campus and I'm leading this big thing. And every year teachers look forward to this, probably more so than the actual students. <laughs> but I'm sharing all this the same, creating that environment of I belong here, you belong here, you're welcome here. It's okay to be who you are. It's okay to know where you come from. That is stuff that I'm, I'm, incorporating into Soul Stimulator Sanctuary. So the four years that I worked at that school <clears throat> and was able to incorporate that feeling with those students and with those teachers that they looked forward to, that is what I am looking to rebuild within the sanctuary. So that four years, that was preparation. So I was there four years, not three. I know I said I did cycles to three, but I was there four years. Um, and that preparation is another element that will be added into the sanctuary. So I hope you're, you know, following along. I'm, I'm sharing how these major things that I that I paid attention to, that I reflected on, all these experiences, all this knowledge that I've gained is really going to help me help you within the sanctuary. So I leave the district. It was not uh how i wanted to leave but i knew i needed to leave like i knew i needed to go but i stayed that extra year 
So see, I was trying to get me out of there in three and I said next year that was on me. Um, but right before I left, I had started a blog. That was one of the reasons I had to leave the school. I started a blog in 2009 called prayingforpurpose.blogspot.com. And the very first blog post I wrote, this was in March 2009. The very first blog post I wrote was essentially calling out racism and colorism on the campus. And I sent that blog post to all the black teachers. And one of the older Hispanic teachers came up to me and was like, Miss Franey, I didn't get your blog post. I was like, I know I didn't send it to you. She said, I just don't understand why I didn't get it. And I'm like, I was just sending it to the black teachers. And so she was upset. She had already read it. it I mean, it, had, it got all the way up to the district office. Like people in, in my area where I taught, they read it, you know, the principal's supervisors had read it. So she wasn't so much upset about what I was talking about. She was just upset she didn't receive the email. So of course, all the black teachers were talking, we're like, yeah, you know, we're starting to notice some things that are changing here in the district. You know, our students are being treated a little different. I was just upset. I was upset because one teacher told me and my students couldn't perform in the Cinco de Mayo program. And I'm like, but I let your students, you know, perform in the Black History program. So I'm just trying to understand why kids just can't perform in a, in a program. It's a program. And so then the teacher was like, okay, I'll come back. And she was like, I'm going to take this one, this one, and this one. All my light-skinned children. I said, no, mm -mm. that's where the blog post came from. And that's where the blow up on campus happened. I was like, you're not about to separate my students like this. Uh, I taught kindergarten. You're not about to separate that the light skinned students are the only ones eligible to perform in the Cinco de Mayo program. I said, it's either all of them or none of them. Well, we can't have your whole class. Fine. None of my students are participating in the Cinco de Mayo program. We'll be in the audience supporting all the other students. So my kids, kindergarten, they don't understand what's happening. Another pre-K teacher came and she was like, I heard what happened. Why don't your class and my class combine and we, you know, get into the Cinco de Mayo program? I'm cool with that, you know. The one who's over the Cinco de Mayo program, she was another pre-K teacher. That's the person on your team. You talk to her. So blog post goes out. Everybody's talking about it. She's like, fine. You and the so-and-so students can participate. So my whole class of kindergarten and the other teachers' whole class of pre-Kers we are going to do our own dance to, um, for the Secret of Mayo program. <laughs> and so uh, we're teaching the kids the dance and stuff like that. They're having fun. They do learn the dance and they do very well with the dance. And we go perform in the program. Everybody loved our dance. Everybody loved parents, students, teachers. Everybody loved it. And so I didn't really talk to that teacher who told me she was only choosing this one, this one, and this one, but she got the message. It's a program. All kids deserve a chance to try out to be in a program in school, regardless of their ethnicity. And so that was the point of my blog post. Don't disrespect my black students because they don't fit into some image that you have or you want to have. Um, for whatever it is you're doing. So that particular situation, not only, you know, started my blogging career, but it also ignited in me something that I had done since middle school. I always sit up and spoke up for people who couldn't or wouldn't speak up for themselves. Sometimes I would speak up for people who just wouldn't speak up for themselves. They would just accept that. And I'm like, no, you don't have to accept that. You know, if you want to do something, you should be eligible to at least try out. Um, you should be given the opportunity. You should be given the chance. Like no one should decide that for you. You should either decide it for yourself or you should be given the chance to see if you're good um, for that particular position or role or whatever. So that was how the blog started where I was like, you know, what? I'm going to champion for my students. And then I, I let that blog 
flipped to the side because I started grad school and that's where I got my master's in organizational leadership. Um, and getting the ma between the master's and the blog post, I became a threat to the administration. So I was being sabotaged behind the scenes um, because they thought I wanted their job and I didn't. I, I did not want to be a principal. Um, so I'm out of the district and I'm like, okay, I get a job teaching English as a second language to adults now. Now I taught English as a second language um, on the elementary level. Now I'm doing it with adults and I'm like, mm, you know, I still don't have enough to do with the day. And one of my friends from the friend who I reached out to when I moved to Houston because I was like, I don't like Atlanta. She was the one who let me stay with her when I moved to Houston. She was like, why don't you start blogging again? I said, okay. Cause she was like, a lot of people like your blog. You're really good at it. And that's when I started Women Are Game Changers. Uh, September 17th, 2011. I sold that blog uh, some years later, but that blog helped me to really create a name for myself and a reputation as someone who speaks up for what is right, uh, calls out what is wrong, champions women, uh, empowers women. Now, I never wanted to be someone to empower someone else. Like, I believe you need to empower yourself. But I got the sentiment that other people got from me doing that, okay? Um, but I believe you need to empower yourself. Do not sit there and wait on someone to come and do something to empower you. So, anyway. Um, and like the next year, I started Fusion Tour. The reason I'm bringing up Fusion Tour is because Fusion Tour is something that just grew and blew up. All I was trying to do as an introvert was find a place to meet other people so that I can, they could hire me to do some blog work. And I did not like networking events. I did not like going in places I didn't know people and to be able to small talk, that is a waste of time in my opinion. So I created Fusion events and people were coming and I would do Twitter chats to promote it and people from other places who followed me were like well when are you bringing it to where i live never crossed my mind but it, it did then um i pitched to some investors through people fund uh and i won here you know back to the scholarships one of the scholarships here i am very first time i pitched to investors i won some money to take fusion from just a houston event to a national event and they gave me money they liked the concept they were like you you knew your numbers you knew how much money you were going to charge per city how much money you were gonna uh revenue you were gonna uh bring in you estimated your expenses and so you knew your profit per city so i i had watched shark tank so i did my studying through shark tank and fusion you know we went to Charlotte, North Carolina, um, Montgomery, Alabama, DC, Philadelphia. Uh, we had a virtual event in Detroit. We were in Chicago. Like we traveled for this event. Okay, so I did that for three years. Back to my season of three. Um, it probably would have been a lot better if I understood the operating and sales and marketing of a national tour, event tour type thing. But it wasn't a lot of information. It wasn't a lot of people doing it. And I didn't know any other bloggers who were literally hosting their own event in multiple cities. Um, so I didn't have a blueprint. So I kind of just let it, I put it on hiatus. It's been on hiatus since like 2015. Um, right 12 13 14 2014 15. i think the last event happened in 2015 and then i ended up selling women are game changers in 2016. so anyway um during that time you know looking back over the years at all that i gained and learned at fusion i was like oh my god like i really learned a lot about operating 
an organization, being able to create a space that people want it to be in. So the sanctuary, I'm creating a space that people want to be in. With Fusion, people came because they knew it was gonna be a safe place for introverts to network. People still are connected. I'm still connected to people from Fusion. Like, we have each other's phone numbers. Like, we can call each other. Um, people who were part of Fusion from different cities have become friends. Never met in person. Some did. I did receive a text from a picture where my Charlotte host and my Montgomery host, they met in person and um, the one from Charlotte, she texted me and she was like, guess who I ran into? And I was like, oh my God. Like they had only knew each other virtually. Um, Cause at the time I was doing Google Hangouts to make sure that the hosts knew each other so that they could share insight on how to market their cities and how to get people to come to the event in their cities. So I was doing live streaming since Google Hangouts. And if you know Google Hangouts, then you know how long ago that was. So anyway, I, um, Fusion really gave me a lot of good experience on opera operational of an organization. That's gonna benefit Soul Simulator Sanctuary because I wanna make sure that you have a seamless experience. But it also helped me see that I know how to create experiences of, and feelings of warmth, welcome, belonging. And that's exactly what you're going to receive when you're in the sanctuary. Uh, that you belong there, that you're welcome there, that you know you could be comfortable there. I did that with Fusion, so I know how to do it in the sanctuary. Then um, I started um, journaling, and I was like, oh, let me teach other people how to journal. That you know how sometimes they say, you know, sometimes God just gives you something for you to do for yourself. That was one of them. However, I did, um, the techniques that I used for journaling did actually help one woman leave a domestic violence marriage and she helped put her now ex-husband uh, in jail for that. So she said it gave her the confidence. So I'm like, even though the company cost me a lot of money like I lost money doing it I helped save a woman's life so at the end of the day if all I needed to do for the truth confidant was put those things in place so she can gain the confidence to leave and place herself in a healthy and safe environment and now she's an advocate helping other domestic uh, violence uh, uh, survivors then I did my thing again if you're called to something you're probably not called to make a whole bunch of money from it. You may have been called to save one person who now they are walking and they're calling because she's good at that. She, I mean, she's doing. she's been doing it for years now. If I had never listened to God and, and say, you know what, I'm just gonna open this up to other people and teach other people how to journal. I would not have been able to help her gain the confidence she needed to leave that situation. And now she's helping other women leave that situation. So that in the sanctuary is what we're really wanting to help you do. Nourish your soul, refuel your soul so that you can develop your spiritual gifts. So you can go and be that, that vessel for God to help bring other people into their calling and help bless other people. So that's what I learned from the Truth Confidant. Um, then I started, uh, I didn't start, I took over. Like someone else has started, Houston African American Bloggers Association. After some digging, I found out who did and I reached out and I'm like, hey, are you gonna do anything with the group? So he and I were, and it was a third person trying to get things off the ground, we met. Because um, I met the third person at Blogalicious when they were in San Antonio. Because I was speaking that year. And the three of us, you know, we were meeting. And then she accepted a job in Dallas and left. I said, okay. So it was just us. And it was like he kind of wasn't as involved. And I was like, dude, just sell me the, the association. I will buy it from you. Like, I see that there's potential here to help other bloggers in the city because... In the beginning, it was only a handful of black bloggers who were being chosen for campaigns, who were being chosen to cover events, who were getting paid. And he and I were two of them. 
And so, and this was like in 2015 when he and I were having this discussion, but I have been getting paid from blogging since 2011. And when I was telling other black bloggers, they were like, you get paid for this? I'm like, yeah, you don't. Like I did research, like people were getting paid. That's why I went back to blogging in 2011. People were getting paid. And so he was like, nah, I just, he did, he, it wasn't something that was interesting to him. Cool. I said, I'll buy it from you. He said, no, don't worry about it. I'm just going to give it to you. So he gave me Houston African American Bloggers Association. And in 2015, June 2015, I went to Blog and White Brown because they were hosting it in Austin. And I started recruiting. I was like, hey, do you live in Houston? You want to join? Like, I was really trying to get the word out. And by that August, like two months later, we had our first conference. Two months from him giving me the association, recruiting at Wagamore Brown, trying to post online. We had like almost 50 people show up to, no, was it that? Was it 2015? It was, dang. Okay, so we had like all these people show up and I was like, I need a venue. So a friend of mine who had a friend who became my friend, she had a daycare, but she had a big space. And she was like, well, you can use my daycare. <laughs> so here we are checking out to Crosby, Texas, because that was the space I could afford. People drove from Houston out there and we hosted the very first Houston African American Bloggers Association conference. Uh, we called it a HAB conference. And so 50 people out there, you know, provided breakfast and lunch, the speakers were great. I mean, it was a great thing that literally was put together in less than two months. And so, you know, I was like, okay, we're gonna need to start having people pay dues. We're going to need to incorporate this, we did like a nonprofit corporation. It wasn't a 50C3. So if you're in Texas, you can do a nonprofit corporation filing. So you can go one or two ways with that. You can go 501C3, being tax exempt, or you can keep it as a nonprofit corporation filing and then you're taxed as an LLC. And so that's what we did. We did a 501, we did a nonprofit corporation filing for the state. And then for the IRS purposes, we were taxed as an LLC because I wanted us still to make money. I didn't want us to have to spend that money in the year. So anyway, uh, that's just a technical, technical term for those who are interested. So you're not technically a LLC by the state, but you are an LLC for tax purposes. So, and then we grew, you, you know, have started to grow, more people joined, a lot, of, you know, a lot of people dropped off because they were like, I don't want to pay dues, that's fine. Uh, I started providing training, I was calling and contacting um, other bloggers I knew from other cities, and they're like, sure, yeah, I'll speak on this subject, like, and they never charged me, they, they never even brought it up. And so that's the power of relationship something you will learn in sanctuary when I started this everybody was on board to support I will never ever ever uh, forget that Lamar Tyler from Tracks Sales and Profit he contacted like every blogger in his community and he was like yo Fernanda needs support she needs help who can do what and people just came and was like you know I can teach this I could do this I could do that and no one charged me so that is community um, but also I was contributing I was engaged I was participating in that community if people needed something I would you know help as well so they helped me when I started have by making sure that we had um, trainings that were being offered monthly to the members I used all of my contacts and network to bring in opportunities to so it it really was a lot of things that I was able to do. I was trying to bring that to the organization so that other black bloggers in Houston had those same opportunities, knew how to turn their blog into a business, knew how to make money, knew how to charge, knew how to take this serious, knew how to tell people that this is a serious thing and they needed to treat it as such. Um, so I'm saying all that to say, at my time leading have while it may not have ended on a good note, and I'm gonna talk about me and 
how my endings are. So I may not have ended on a good note, but I learned so much about leadership, about running an organization, about creating a space where people want to belong and they're able to take what they need and they can go when they need to go. Um, and they know that they're going to get support while they're there. Um, I, it was, for me, it was very hard to leave because I had invested so much in me and so much of my time, my money, like literally to get it started, my sister funded, um, have in 2015, mother of three. Um, she gave the money so that Hap could get off the ground. She paid for the filing for the state and everything like that. So I felt so connected to this uh, association because my family had invested to help me get this off the ground. And so how things played out, it really just irritated my soul. I mean, irritated my soul. But again, God told me to leave in 2017. Harvey had happened and I was like no like me telling God no God like I need to help steer uh, people through this and I need to make sure that things are set up and I need to make sure that I have procedures in place and people are trained and you know I had all these things that I, 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 I needed to do and so the way it happened God was like well you didn't listen so I'm gonna make sure you listen and so 2018 everything kind of fell apart and um, I separated on not good terms with some people. I still talk to people from the association, but certain people, um, you know, honestly, I would never speak to again, and that's okay. Uh, they may never speak to me again, and that is okay. That is okay. That is okay. So anyway, um, <laughs> I realized that, you know, three years in, and so from 2018, 2019, and 2020, those three years, I was literally being restored again, season of three. Um, I was being restored into who God had positioned and called and created me to be. And during that time from 2018 to to now, 2018, you know, I went back to church. I worked with a spiritual life coach, 2019. I did a, my first 40 day fast. I read the entire Bible in here, 2020. Boom, we're all sitting here at home for a year. Okay, I was at home for a year. Some of y'all were still out doing whatever. I'm not talking about the people who had to go to work. I'm talking about people who just couldn't sit at home. So, um, and I use that time to really start praying with intentionality and start, um, I was already reading the Bible because I had read it, you know, in 2019 cover to cover. So I'm already used to that. Um, I started to get more involved in the church that I had joined in 2018. So it took till... <laughs> 2020, I went and visited the church because um, it was in another state. I lived in Houston and it was in another state. I went for about three weeks and in 2020, I went through their entire discipleship model like so quickly. Um, the acceleration, the speed in which I went through that discipleship model stuns me. And so that is where the rapid acceleration of my growth happened last year and it was also where the fellowship between me and God grew deeper so from 2018 to 2020 it was just like that was it that's all that I was supposed to do um I was not supposed to go lead and do anything else I was supposed to rebuild fellowship with God and I did that I stopped trying to force anything to happen I still worked on my blog, made money from that, and I took a part-time job, but essentially I was supposed to help clear myself mentally, emotionally, spiritually, financially. Oh my God, last year, the biggest financial blessing I've ever received um, happened last year. Um, physically, you know, I started 
taking care of my health again because you know I went into a little depressive funk after what happened leaving have in 2018 so it was it was a lot of restoring and rebuilding myself and in the process I was restoring and rebuilding fellowship with God and so fast forward to 2000 um, 21 and I leave the church that I was a member of I realized I had outgrown so 2018 2019 2020 21 about three years right cycle of three God saw me because I had literally prayed God I do not understand parables and analogies and metaphors and all of this stuff from a biblical sense please give me clear concise confirmation that was a Thursday by that Tuesday, I had already separated from the church. That wasn't the question that I had, but it was the answer that I received. And according to my bestie, I received a FedEx prayer, an uh, answer prayer. So I accepted that. It, in the moment, I was like stunned and shocked. And then probably within 24 hours of praying, I was like, oh, that was an answer prayer. I need to accept it and I need to move on because two weeks before I had, um, God had given me soul, soul stimulators. Then I received soul stimulator sanctuary not too long later. So God had been preparing me to create this soul stimulator sanctuary. So I'm, I'm sharing all this to, to say that from the time I was 11 years old till now, over the past 25 years, God has been putting me in very difficult situations to prepare me to be able to walk with you as you go through difficult situations so that you can unpack and process mentally, emotionally, and you can be spiritually uh, nourished and refueled so you can go and walk in what you were called to do. I have been prepared for the past 25 years to help you, and I am I've accepted the calling. I, I wasn't hesitant when God told me this is what I was going to do. I was just like, I don't understand. Like, you know, I was pretty much lambasted for talking about socialization, which was the word I knew, but it was actually fellowship. And when I did the research, I'm like, I have been doing this for 25 years. Um, but I just had never been taught in the Christian setting that fellowship is more than eating in the fellowship hall and so that is something that I have been God had been preparing me for 25 years and I was like okay you know what I'll do this the only hesitation I had was like I don't want people to think that I left the church and I'm trying to do this as you know well I left the church so I'm going to do it better because this is not a church this is not a ministry this is not, you know, a nonprofit. This is literally God called me to create Soul Simulator Sanctuary to help you rebuild fellowship with Him so you can have fellowship with other believers. And in the process, you are being developed, uh, your spiritual gifts are being developed, and you're going to go out and leave the sanctuary and do what you're called to do. This is a safe, sacred refuge for people who want to to be in obedience so you can glorify God okay this we're choosing we're choosing this and so um then my friend was like and even my mom was like you know if this is what you're supposed to do go do it and I'm like okay you know I I wasn't worried about what they were thinking I was just worried that people would say this is just too soon and I didn't want people to misinterpret because this is not a retaliation against anyone um, because that ministry still serves people who are broken and who may have not been in church. Like I hadn't been in church 50 years before I joined that church. So it still has its purpose. I just outgrew it and that is okay. We have to learn in the Christian community that we can outgrow ministries and it is okay to walk away. Like if you're saying something or seeing something and the ministry is like, we're not expanding to accommodate that, then the ministry purpose is very specific and you have grown outside of that purpose and you just go on to something else and it is okay there is no hard feelings there is no there should be no hard feelings there should be no animosity we just grew past that and so um 
to you're gonna grow past the sanctuary that is the corpus is for you to grow past it you're not gonna you shouldn't be there forever okay you should not be there forever you should be there long enough to gain the confidence so you can go out and do what you're called to do i don't want you here two three years you're you're really gonna need to talk to god if you're here for two three years unless you know we bring you on board and you're now leading and doing some stuff within the sanctuary but if you're just here as a member no mm -mm, mm -mm. you've got to go you got to grow <laughs> you gotta go um because we're not here to have you staying and being dependent on us to do everything for you we're here to show you how to do it for yourself how to read how to pray how to fellowship how to have relationships with other believers we're here to teach you that but you are going to have to start implementing and doing and then you're going to have to go and use your spiritual gifts and what you're called to do so no you please understand you're not going to be here for three years i'm trying to make that very clear i don't expect anyone to be here for three years unless i hire you to work for the, the sanctuary um and that's if God says, hey, you know, we're not to hire this person and I would do that. But other than that, this is just a, a, a time, a season in your life that you're getting nourished or you're getting refueled and then you're moving on. So anyway, we're here from age 11 to um, 30. I, why don't I, I remember how old I am? 36 <laughs> right yeah I'm 36 okay so um, 25 years God has been preparing me in 25 years I've taken those lessons I may not know, have known what they were being used for but I've taken those lessons and I've kept them with me and everything I've learned everything I've experienced everything I've gathered is going to be utilized in the sanctuary to the best of the ability of the sanctuary so that it benefits you you are you feel welcomed you feel like you belong there's warm there's so that you feel comfortable you begin to create fellowship between you and god you begin to fellowship with other people you start developing your spiritual gifts and then you're like oh i got it you know god called me to do this I need to leave the sanctuary to go and do it. Praying nothing but peace for you as you go and you do. Um, so yeah, that is a long story, but I wanted you to be able to really understand that I was called to this, but I have been prepared for 25 years of leadership in different positions, um, creating the atmosphere in different places so that when the sanctuary when it was time for the sanctuary when people are in are desiring to belong to something that they can still get spiritually nourished I would be equipped to do that and that is exactly um, why the last three years why I needed to be away from everyone why I left Facebook um, because I needed to be able to be in communion with God without distraction because emotionally, mentally, spiritually, he was pouring into me so that I could be prepared for what happened. I don't even know when it happened. Jen, it was whenever the Texas freeze was. See, dates and stuff, just for some reason, 2021, 20, that I can't get it. But anyway, all of everything transpired of me leaving the church happened literally during the freeze so i'm literally without water in my home when i'm like i'm leaving the ministry that i literally came back to and i felt saved me in 2018 and now in 2021 i'm i'm leaving it god really and is this how you know i'm supposed to leave it and so it was just he had been preparing me and my mom was like, you're being tested. Are you going to pass the test? And I believe I passed the test. And so now I'm ready to um, open the doors on May 5th, 2022. 
2021 to all of you for Soul Simulator Sanctuary and help you be able to get spiritually nourished or spiritually refueled so that you can go out and do what you were called to do. So thank you for listening to my ever so long 25 year journey story of how I became prepared to lead the Soul Stimulator Sanctuary. Until next video, this is Bernetta Rochelle, and again, thank you so much for watching, and I hope you subscribe to my channel because, you know, I'm putting out great content, and every Thursday, I'm doing a recap of the 52-week Bible challenge, so if you want to be able to read the Bible in a year or less, get the guide, and join me on Thursdays as I recap every week of me reading the Bible in um, 52 weeks or less, right? Until then, I will see you next video. Bye.